ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at the 2016 General Meeting of Recreational Aviation Australia here in Canberra. Just before we start the meeting, I'm going to hand you to your President, um, a few emergency notifications to start with. Um, the doors that you came in is an emergency exit, um, and there's an exit out the back and around to the door on your left, my right. Um, if there is alarms or we do need to evacuate, the assembly point is onto Peary Street out the front here, turn right, across the road and there's an assembly point, a car park just across the road there and everybody... Uh, this microphone is for the purposes of our digital audience. Yes. They're out on the internet all over Australia listening live broadcast. So that's another announcement in a second. The toilets are through the door to my right, your left, up the corridor and out the back into the car park. The doors should be chocked open already. Um, and then you just make your way back through this door, but we've got all the doors chocked open. It's a generally a secure building during the week, but we've chocked all the doors open for you. Um, there's tea and coffee that you're welcome to enjoy. Depending on the length of the meeting, we may have a break at 3, 3.15 p.m., um, but we may be finished at that stage. We don't know, depending on what's going. Um, with that, we welcome our digital audience for the third time. We've um, actually established our own digital process here rather than hiring in services. It's the first time we've run this service ourselves. So thanks to Hayley and Katie on the desk today. And we're broadcasting across the country to all our members. Um, they've been given details and login details on YouTube and on the RAL's website. And we've got some presentations that we'll go through throughout the course of the meeting. But without any further ado, I'll hand over to our chairman, Mr. Michael Monk, to open the meeting and take us through the proceedings for the day. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'll now declare the meeting open. So welcome to the general meeting um, for May 2016 and uh, thank you for coming and thanks to all those who've um, joined us online as well. Um, just recently, uh, in memory of those who've, um, who've passed away while flying, we've, we've changed our, uh, the way that we hold these general meetings. Um, and, and I just want to remind everyone that um, uh, since our last meeting, we've lost uh, Ross Millard, Rodney Hay, uh, Bradley Karen, Ian Cook and Terry Otway um, and two members of the, uh, the public, uh, Kwok Huang Vu and uh, Owen Roberts as well. So um, you know, we send our respects to, um, to their family and, and friends uh, and all those who knew them. Uh, the first order of business today is the receipt of apologies and, uh, and proxies. I've got some apologies from the Holbrook Aero Club from John Harley, Rod Dowding, uh, Andrew uh, Vonarx, Graham Hawke, Bill Lewis, Nigel Holloway, uh, Les Lefebvre, Bruce Avery, James Crozier, Ian Dooley and Frank Tapp. Um, so thanks to those guys for, um, for their apologies. Um, we've also got to uh, receive the proxies. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what the, what the process exactly is there, but um, I might just hand to Tony for a, a moment just to talk about the proxies and the, the process uh, that we've gone through and the, the scrutineering. Thanks Mick. Um, quite a number of proxies have been received and um, we uh, engaged a um, local law firm which, with, uh, which we don't normally do business um, to uh, scrutinise the proxies and make sure that everything is uh, valid and uh, above board. Um, and uh, I've got a letter from them here that we received yesterday afternoon. As you, pro as you all be aware, um, the deadline for proxies to be received at the office was 2pm yesterday. And um, the uh, lawyers have come in after that to um, scrutinise all the proxies. Um, they've confirmed that everything was um, satisfactory. Um, 948 proxies were received. Of those, 550 were in favour of the chairman. 47 of the proxies in favour of the chairman were against all of the resolutions, whilst the balance were in favour or left him to vote as he sees fit. There were 351 proxies given to financial members other than the chairman. Of those, 263 were in favour, 68 were against. The remaining 20 proxies were given to their proxy to vote as see fit. So that means we have a total of 948 proxies uh, a total of 115 that were against the resolutions uh, and a further 20 that were given to um, various members to vote as they see fit. 
So uh, that's the state of play with proxies. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Tony. Um, the next item is a confirmation of the, the quorum. Um, we've clearly got a quorum today, so there's no need to do a, a head count. Uh, we're well over that number. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, uh, say um, uh, the minutes of the last general meeting. Um, they've been published online, been made available to members uh, and board members alike. Um, does anyone have any comments or feedback on those minutes from the last general meeting? Um, if there's no feedback, then can we have a mover that they be accepted? Got a mover. Um, where's our minute taker? Over, over there. Um, can you just provide your name to Kel? And a seconder, can you provide your name, Ian, to Ian Baker? Um, so we'll accept those uh, minutes. Um, business arising out of the minutes, can you just go to that? Um, there was no business. Uh, actions, yeah. Uh, no business was arising out of those minutes uh, from the last meeting. So we'll move on to the, the reports. Um, we've got a, a president, a secretary, um, a financial report, and, uh, and a CEO's report. Um, from the, uh, the, the President's point of view, from my point of view, uh, we focused on uh, a, a few areas this year. We've got, um, as everyone can see over on the screen, we've uh, made significant improvements to our IT systems. There's been tech manual and ops manual rewrites. Uh, we've made some progress on new endorsements uh, and we've undergone the organisational review which we're here to discuss today. With respect to the IT systems, <coughs> I'd like to say thanks to the, the staff for all the effort they've put in. They've, they've put in a tremendous effort over the last year um, and that's resulted in the introduction of a members portal um, which is slowly being rolled out to um, increase functionality to CFIs as well uh, and increase the level of service to you guys. No longer do you have to uh, you know, ring up the office to change your details or do you know, silly little things like that. You can now log on uh, and, and do that immediately. Of course, um, members being central to everything we do um, if, you, if you want to ring the office, feel free. They're always happy to talk to you. Uh, but this, this provides you uh, a, an additional avenue to, um, <clears throat> to update your details uh, easily. Um, was there a question over here? No? No? Scratching your nose? Yeah. Um, the, um, the tech manual and ops manual rewrite, uh, those are in the, the final stages uh, now. They're going to be presented to the board tomorrow um, by Darren and Jill. Where's Jill? Jill. Um, we're going to have a discussion over them. Um, there's uh, some significant improvements, uh, especially in the technical area. We've um, made significant advances um, in terms of being able to modify our aircraft a whole lot more effectively uh, than what we could in the past. And, uh, and a lot of these new processes will go a long way to, um, to reducing the, the, the chance of going back to where we were four or five years ago when um, our aircraft were granted mine as well. Uh, the Ops Manual rewrite, we've done a, um, or Jill has done a significant amount of work on the, uh, especially the powered parachute area, but we're also looking into, um, uh, I, I spoke in the magazine a couple of months ago about trust, and we, we're trying to get that philosophy to come into the uh, Ops Manual uh, in terms of you know, type training, utility endorsements, and so on and so forth. Um, just building on that a little bit further, the new endorsements that are coming out uh, in, in, in addition to the utility endorsement, we've also got controlled airspace and, um, and increases, not, not that it's an endorsement, but increases to uh, maximum takeoff weight. They're two big things that we'll have with uh, an application in with CASA for uh, mid this year, by the end of June is the plan. And, um, and again, Darren and Jill should be commended for their efforts on, uh, on, on preparing that. The organisational review today, um, I, I think we might hold off on that conversation a little bit. Um, we'll have a bit more of an introduction into the, the new constitution, the changes to the organisation and whatnot. Uh, but for the moment, we'll, we'll focus on the reports and, uh, and we'll come back to that. So I'll hand over to Tony just to talk to the uh, secretary's report and then we'll um, move over to uh, Michael for the financial and CEO reports. Thanks, Mick. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what um, Mick has said. Um, the organisation has um, compl been compliant over the last period with um, the requirements that are in the constitution and the law 
um, well, we've got a good team taking care of all that and um, that uh, has made the job uh, quite straightforward, uh, just verifying that um, the uh, office have done what they should be doing. Um, we've had a couple of resolutions um, made by the board since the last um, board meeting. Uh, those were published on the website. One was uh, a resolution to adopt a strategic plan and the other one was a resolution to rescind the minimum age for student pilots. Um, both of those have been published um, on the um, website and so forth to the members as required straight after the decision. Um, and um, our, um, yeah, generally our constitutional requirements are being met and uh, the office is uh, doing a great job of that, so I don't really have anything else to add. Thanks. Can we just get the microphone over? We have a question here. Thanks. In the front. In the front. In the front. Sorry. Sorry. Just so our digital audience can hear us. Um, David King from uh, Holbrook. We've had roughly a thousand proxies, so we've had roughly a ten percent, um, you know, of our of our members come back and vote or do something about it. Have we got some way of knowing how many people are actually going to click into the online broadcast? No, no idea how many people will actually dial in today. I don't know how many we've got online. If we know the number online currently. The last couple of meetings we've had uh, between 70 and 150 people dial in, so not many people dial in or choose to dial in. Um, and historically, the, 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 the number of proxies we've got today is a record number of proxies for any meeting in the history of, of RILs. So it's a significant um, volume of people have engaged with the organisation, which is fantastic to see. So that's really good. So 11 online. 11 online so. G'day, you 11 out there. Ring your friends up, get them in. Is that my wife there as well? Maybe she's watching. <laughs> if she is. Um, so my presentation, just a, a word from the, the Chief Executive. The first thing I'd, I'd like to have a quick look at is a, a brief look into the office. And now and then is, is the way I've, I've done this presentation today. Then is about three to five years ago. Um, and you can see we had 19 staff and three pilots in the organisation. What a lot, wasn't a lot of expertise, significant commitment and a little bit of expertise, but what we've done in the last few years um, is really build up the skill set of people in the office. So we've got people with master's degrees, people with marketing degrees, accident investigations um, is, is fantastic. Actually, Darren is, is, is here today, is one of the most highly qualified accident consultants um, in the country with the qualifications and expertise that he's building up, um, plus three other staff in the office with, with those expertise, that level of expertise, which is fantastic, in addition to the pilots um, that we've got um, and the skilling that we're doing is um, Katie sat through a, a safety management system training seminar last year. It wasn't a seminar, it was a five-day training course with the senior managers, um, as well as grief counselling and customer service. So a whole range of things that we're trying to do to deliver better services to you guys, to members. It's about servicing the members and, and getting in touch with the members and understanding the business that we're in and trying to improve RIOs. So that's just a little look at, at, at what we've done um, in, in the office. Next thing I'd like to look at is a, a typical day um, in the office, and again, we've got a, a now and then scenario where we're getting, you know, a, a while ago, <coughs> we're getting 100 calls a day, you know, mail was sent every day, it was quite busy um, in the office, lots of busy work going on. Um, where now, we've reduced the, the number of mail, we've reduced the number of phone calls into the office. Um, more importantly, members are dialing in and logging into their, their web portal, 95 members a day are, are logging in themselves, finding out their information themselves, registering their aircraft, paying their membership fees, checking their BF, BFR due date and that type of stuff. So again, having control, putting control of, of your um, relationship with RLs back in your hands and allowing you to control that. And there's further improvements um, down the track. We've got Jared um, here today. If you want to talk about the improvements that are coming to the members portal over the next um, few months, chat to Jared. If you want to see what's happening with the CFI portal, chat to Jill. Um, and see what's going on there. Some really exciting stuff that's happening in the portal. So we're excited about some of the stuff um, that we're delivering. The next slide. Um, if we look externally, what have we do been doing externally? And again, then, we didn't have a lot of external coverage, a lot of, you know, very few Facebook followers. Um, the magazine was, was printed and, and sent out. 
And, and one of the interesting things with the magazine um, that I'd like to say is that it, it's a central communication tool of the organisation. We took a financial decision 12 months ago to introduce subscriptions and go to a digital model. That doesn't mean that that's what's going to be in place forever. There's a, there, there, I see a time, a long-term vision, that organisationally we achieve financial safety or security that we can send a magazine out to everybody free of charge. And that's a long-term goal down the track that I've set for the organisation. We shouldn't have to charge members for a magazine. Um, we want to still continue to pro provide the digital copy, but at this point in time, where we are now, bringing ourselves out of some deficits and getting the organisation back onto its, its footing, which is exactly what we're trying to do uh, with a lot of the changes that we've proposed today, is ultimately, I see a time when we go, fantastic, this is great. You know, is there a time that we can reduce membership fees? I'd love to be able to recommend to the board that we reduce membership fees. So long term, there's some long term thinking that we're starting to put into this organisation to really set us up for success um, in the future. Um, but as you can see, you may. Can we just, just? There's a fair bit of noise from the air conditioning, and it's very difficult to hear you down here. Please speak distinctly please? and loudly. Okay, we're going to turn the air conditioner off. Hopefully we don't turn the power off. I'm going to... There we go. Peace and quiet. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so we've got 9,000... Seven or 800 Facebook followers now, which is a fantastic communication tool, and we're using that to really get engaged with a different audience, a dynamic audience, um, and a lot of messages there. Um, the magazine, we've got 1,800 subscribers, 4,500 people get it from our website, and 2,000 people get it from the magazine website issue. We're also looking at shortly putting it onto another platform, um, Zinio, and getting it out to another audience, so really expanding the, the readership of the magazine. So there's some Oh, the million hits, yeah, we clocked over a million views of the magazine since we went live less than 12 months ago in July. The magazine was seen last week um, for the millionth time online, which is just fantastic. Phenomenal coverage for the magazine. Uh, 35,000 web hits per month now, so the website's very busy, very popular, which is good. Um, members emailed at least once a month. The last seven or eight weeks it's been once a week to keep everybody informed. And we're engaging with, we've engaged with about 1,500 members at fly-ins and air shows in the last um, 12 months, which is fantastic. Um, internally, if we look at some numbers, just some, some raw numbers, yes, our memberships have, have dropped off a little bit. We're at 8,600 members now. We need to do some work and get some people back to flying. We've had a number of good programs to get people back to flying. Our aircraft register, though, is increasing, which is an interesting dynamic for the organisation. Less people, but more aircraft. So are we seeing more people own aircraft? Um, and aircraft changes hands every 36 hours in the RAL's fleet. So there's significant turnover of aircraft, but they're continuing to grow the number of aircraft in our fleet, which is fantastic. Uh, we've got 164 schools, 43 clubs, 450,000 hours flown last year. Phenomenal volume of hours flown. It's another improvement to the web portal. You'll soon be able to put all your hours in yourselves, keep them updated, check your history of hours, um, and give us a lot more information about hours flown with the organisation, which is a very important um, metric for us. Uh, 2.9 fatalities per 100,000 hours, so that's down. Um, we, we're seeing overall similar number of fatal accidents a, a year between the 7 and 10 mark, but we're flying more hours. So the, the I fatal incident per 100,000 hours is dropping, which is good news, and we're really focusing on safety. Um, if you really want to have a chat to, to safety, Katie's here today. Um, she's currently managing the, the web broadcast um, this afternoon. But if you want to chat to Katie about some of the things we've got planned for safety and continuing that safety message, have a chat to Katie today. It's really exciting stuff that we've got planned. Um, and we get about 100 reported accidents per year. Um, snapshot of the last 18 months. I'm not going to read each of these. This is just a real quick snapshot of what we've achieved. We've, we've rolled out so much in the last 18 months. It's a phenomenal amount of work. And I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the work that the team has put in. Um, a lot of the staff are here today, um, which is fantastic for, for them to be acknowledged for the effort that they've put in. It's not a one-man show or a two-man show or a show run by the board. It's a whole group of 15... 14, 15 people in the office that have done some fantastic things that you can see there and we've got more things planned. The next slide covers a whole range of additional things um, that we've achieved as well. So some really good positive outcomes 
that we've achieved in the last 18 months and I'm immensely proud and I'd like to publicly acknowledge and thank the staff for their hard work and effort. Um, they're a dream team to work for, work with um, and I enjoy every day working with them. So thank you guys. Um, and I believe we punch above our weight. So we've got 14 staff and some of the things we've delivered is phenomenal in, in the last 18 months. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to work and, and the team really enjoy um, delivering the services to members. The challenges ahead, we face a, a number of challenges. Educating our, our members is, is key. We've got Hayley with us today who's, who's helping running the, the broadcast today. She's our learning and development um, officer. She's really going to get into education and some of the exciting things that we've got planned with education and training is going to be really cool, really exciting stuff planned. Um, we need to facilitate organisation the disciplinary framework where we give action. This is about a conversation with people when things go wrong. It's not about punishing people. And the whole culture of the organisation from the president down is shifting um, or has shifted to, to that, um, that philosophy now, which is really fantastic, really exciting. Um, and we need to shape, shape a conversation on trust. Mick wrote an article in the magazine about trust. We need to trust the members more. The members need to trust the organisation more. We need to trust and use our CFIs more. Um, we've had some dark days in the past. Everybody acknowledges that, but it's time to draw a line in the sand. Everybody rebuild the trust and move on with the business of getting everybody into the air. Um, the modernisation project that we rolled out, fantastic, significant investment for the organisation. We covered this over the last 12 months. Uh, we invested about a quarter of a million dollars um, in this project. The question I ask is, is on the next slide. Has it delivered? Um, it's a critical question that we need to ask. Has it delivered? I think it has. Um, it's delivered significant benefits. We're seeing 100 members a day using it. We're starting to see savings in the office. We've saved physical resources, human resources, um, and members are starting to really take it up. And we're getting lots and lots of reports in through the occurrence management system. So it's starting to feed in information to us about what the risks are in the organisation, what the safety issues are, what the mistakes that people make are, which will help us educate and improve everybody down the track. So I think it's paying dividends um, and it's a, a really good project and successful project delivered on budget and on time, which is good as well. Um, other hot topics, as uh, Mick alluded to in, in his presentation, we're chasing increased weight and we're chasing, chasing access to CTA. And Darren and Jill can feed, fill you in on those. If you want to individually talk to them where we're at, submissions are going to CASA over the next six to, to seven weeks. So we're excited about that as well. That's um, my report, but uh, our treasurer has asked me just to briefly talk about the finances and present a brief financial snapshot. Um, this is it. Had a deficit last year of $257,000. Uh, we had an, an initial planned deficit of 400000 so we did reasonably well um, when we ended up with a deficit of $260,000 last year. So historically, again, significant deficits. We're trying to improve that. If we go to the next slide and we look at where we're at now, the first nine months of... Uh, we have significant reserves. So, th so the deficit is covered by reserves, is it? That's correct, how, yes. How are they travelling? The, the reserves, we've still got about $1 million in reserves and our balance sheets in reserves is held in cash and we've got the asset the financial footing. Yeah. And the board spent significant time today at their board meeting talking about the financial structure of the organisation and the safety level of reserves and the vision that I have, one day we get so secure with our, with our finances that we can reduce membership fees or hand the magazine back. Um, I don't think when we have significant reserves, we should be looking at charging members more. That's when we start to give money back to members through reduced fees or additional services. At this point in time, we're still trying to get ourselves back on an even footing. We're going to run a small deficit this year. Um, we're budgeting for you know, a break-even, small deficit, small surplus next year. Um, but it's, it's a, just a, a difficult climax. We've got another question over here. Thanks, Jill. Uh, Michael, um, I seem to recall a figure of $400,000 being saved when we stopped producing the magazine on a regular basis. Uh, where does that figure actually show up anywhere? 
it wasn't an actual saving of $400,000. The cost of producing the magazine for free was $400,000. We're still producing the magazine, obviously, so there's still a cost with that, and we're still posting it to some people, but we have enjoyed a significant saving. We've probably halved the cost of the delivery of the magazine, if not more. I'd have to look at the detail, the figures in a little bit more detail. We did budget to get about 3,500 subscribers to the magazine. We've only, well, we have, I shouldn't say only, we've achieved about 1,800 subscribers to the magazine, so people are choosing to go to the digital version, which is great, um, but there still is a cost with that. About 3,000, 3,400 subscribers is a break-even point for the magazine, so there's still a cost in delivering the magazine to fewer yeah, numbers. That, and that figure is we've got 1,400, uh, or sorry, 1,800, is it, who receive the magazine? Or is yes, it 1,800. So, um, there's another 6,500 who don't receive that, machine, that magazine, and on that basis also is, we've, you told us just a few minutes ago that We've got 1,400 members who receive the magazine and about 4,000 who, or three or 4,000 who download it. Does that mean that over 40% well, of our members aren't receiving any communication? No, I said um, 1,800 subscribe, 4,500 download it, another 2,000 see it on issue. So there's about 8,000 members uh, seeing the magazine. So. We used to send 10,000 copies or 9,400, 9,500 out. I had many people said to me, I used to read the magazine cover to cover and I'd ask them about something in the magazine and they'd never seen it. So I don't think everybody read the magazine cover to cover every issue. So are we getting to most members with the magazine? I think we are. I think we're getting to, to most people with the magazine and the downloads continue to increase um, every month. Not to mention that we are putting it in schools for free and clubs for free, so people are reading it there, so they're not going to be included in those statistics. You might get 30 people go to the local club and look at the magazine in the club. We're never going to know that number or where people are reading it. So that, that's an important number, plus people who share it. So one person might buy it and share it with three or four of their friends, or one person downlo downloads it and then they send it out to three or four people as well. So we're never going to capture that duplication um, down the track, but our figures are showing us that between 7,500, 8,500 people a month uh, directly accessing the magazine in some printed or digital format. Cool. Oh, my iPad's going to turn. So as I said, the balance sheet, the question up the back, uh, looked at the, our reserves, the balance sheet's still got 1.7 million um, in total equity, which is a, a very solid position. We're running at a current deficit of about 168,000. We're going to claw some of that back um, this year in the next three months. Um, we continue to exhibit conservative fiscal strategy, of course, um, and as I said, we expect to reduce that deficit. Some of the things impacting the deficit on the next slide. Um, the success of Digital Sport Pilot, as I said, we've got 1,800 sub subscribers, so people chose to choose the digital copy. We've still got to produce the magazine. There's still the, the editorial content, which is a cost, and that's always going to be a cost, whether you produce or share the magazine with one person or 10,000 people. That's the same cost. Uh, we've got unplanned legal costs. We had a couple of legal matters last year that weren't budgeted and weren't planned um, that the organisation was exposed to, and we needed to engage um, external legal support for that. There's some additional expenses. Um, or reduced revenue in our membership slip for every 100 members leaving the organisation, we're only getting 97 members renew and we need to do some work with that and the board spent some time talking about marketing today so we've got a whole marketing strategy that we're going to roll out um, next year to try and attract and, and renew and improve membership. Um, higher than planned office and travel expenses, there are some additional expenses for the CFI conference and a couple of um, development conferences as well as attending some of the fatal accidents this year, been in very remote places and the time involved in those um, investigations hasn't been just there and back in a day, it's been two, three um, days at, at sometimes and that adds to the cost um, to the organisation attending those incidents. Um, but as I said, significant clawback in the last three months and we're going to continue to see that clawback over the next couple of months. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it on the finances. We're all, way, all working towards um, our mission, which is safe, accessible, fun, educational. We're looking at updating the word educational. We previously had enjoyable. Um, the board's got a consider, uh, are currently considering um, adjusting that to educational with our focus on education and training and the appointment of Haley to a learning and development position. Um, we're going to really ramp up the education side of things over the next 12 months. And I think that's it. And thanks to Mark Christie for the lovely photo. Question? Sorry. 
lots of light shining in here that you can't see. Yeah, my name's Alf George. Um, do you think it's acceptable to run... Th the three years so far we've run at a, in a deficit. Um, I'm not quite... Sh I don't quite remember the figures, but that would be half of the uh, recreation aviation's equity has been lost in the last... Is that how I see it, or am I grossly wrong? I mean, governments and everybody running businesses seem to like to run at a deficit. Am I misguided here, or, or should you be aiming for at least a zero result? Yeah, we, we should be aiming for to balance the budget, definitely. Right. Okay. And right so now, we, we're not structured to... Insurance continues to, to increase. We haven't put membership fees up. So something has to give at some point, and that, that's exactly what the board's considering. We had a lengthy discussion today um, on that. I'm quite happy for Don or um, Barry to, to chime in here and, and chat on the financial structure and what we're planning over the next four or eight months, if these guys want to comment on it as well. But we're planning for a, a balanced budget. But today, it's not possible at this point in time, the way the business is and, and where we are. But it is very conservative planning um, and one of the reasons we took a significant investment in the digitisation was the long-term savings. That digitisation project was going to pay for itself in two and a half years, um, which then we start to see significant savings um, from the investment. That We've already seen savings in terms of staff, reduced printing in the office, reduced postage um, in the office. So those type of savings are going to take a couple of years to really kick in. But I don't know whether Don or Mick might. Um, I, I just want to add to that that um, <clears throat> I've been here for three years now. Um, prior to me coming in, we, we had deficits of three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. The process we've put in place will take time to have effect. For example, the modernisation project, it, it's taken us about 12 months or so to roll out. Um, in the meantime, we've incurred expenses with that, that rollout project, but we've also had to conduct business as usual. And it's only just recently that we've really started to realise those savings by allowing... Um, you know, our, our staff levels to drop by one full-time equivalent. So these things will take time. That said, um, our first cut of the budget, which we looked at today, um, is is looking at a very small uh, deficit of about fifty thousand next year. So over the over a period of um, you know three years, uh, in in my term, we've gone from minus four hundred thousand from memory. Um, to you know minus fifty, so it's getting smaller and it is getting better. It's definitely getting better. Did you want to add to that, Don? Just, just to point that um, you have to realise. Sorry, sorry. Just to realise that the deficits didn't arise overnight. The, this goes back to a history that we've had for um, uh, creating expenses, I guess, in the last, particular last three or four years. Um, the, uh, the current management has done a fantastic job on, on pulling us out of that hole that we were in. We all recognise it from a couple of years ago when lots of aeroplanes on the ground, not able to collect um, uh, fees from some of those people for some of that time. Um, but but the, as Mick says, you know, we, we are on the upswing, definitely, and um, I, I can see us operating uh, yeah, around the break-even mark, which is what we'll intend to do. But don't lose sight of the fact that we did have a very substantial uh, financial reserve and as, and as Michael said, yeah, um, we, we are nowhere near having insufficient reserves, I guess put it that way. And we shouldn't be putting fees up to cover um, the, the small losses we're facing at the moment while we've got more reserves than we really need. Uh, so we'll, we'll run on the reserves for a bit longer, but not much longer and not much of them. Thanks. That's our mic. There's another mic out there. So that um, finishes my report, so you might want to have all the reports put to the... Um, are there any other questions on any of those reports? Um, yeah, Mido? Thank you. Uh, uh, Paul Middleton, and I'd like to commend the job you've done because we, uh, we did get in a mess there a few years back when CASA moved the goalposts on us and it all went to grubs. So I commend uh, on the moves you've made. But I wonder, could you tell us how much you've spent... Um, the executive have spent moving around the countryside selling the new constitution? I don't know the number off the top of my head, um, but what I can say is we've, we've managed to get to, I think the, the final number is around about 1,500 members uh, for around about half the cost that we contacted members at, um, at Natfly. Um, so we've covered a lot, a lot of ground. Um, and, and it's... 
Uh, like I say, I can't tell you the number off the top of my head. It's it's in the accounts. Um, I'll, I'll take it on notice, but I I'm, I think it's around the order of about twelve thousand dollars. The travel around the country, the Constitution was part of it, and only the last two actual meetings were as part of the, the vote recently, every other meeting. And we've tied every visit in with an airship. Ops manual talking to members about changes to powered parachutes. You know, we're at Evans Head talking about issues up there, airspace issues. We also meet with ministers. We met with the, the minister in Brisbane talking about ethanol tax. So to say we've travelled around the country selling the constitution, I think, isn't isn't a complete picture, isn't an accurate statement. We've travelled to talk to people. Um, we went to Perth, fantastic opportunity. First time we went to, to Perth to see the, air, the aer Aerofest at Busselton. But we also went to um, Bunbury and Jandicott and Perth and spent three or four hours with our friends in the powered parachute community over there who had significant concerns about powered parachutes and how we promote and change powered parachutes. And that meeting informed us and we've come back to Jill and given her advice and guidance on where the powered parachute movement is. So to me, an incredibly important meeting. We probably spent five minutes in Perth talking about the constitution. The rest of the time it was talking about the business of RALs and how we grow and develop the business um, to our 600 members in Perth and get more members in Perth. So um, I, I think it's been appropriate spending as Mick said, it's about 12000 but I'll take the question on notice, Mido, and we'll go to, to the finances, and I'll give you an exact figure. Any other questions? Keith Baker. I'd like to uh, thank the existing committee and all the people who have put in the work since February 14, where it was diabolical. And uh, looking at that, all of those things that, that we see, there's nothing wrong with what I see. All right, we're running a little bit of a def deficit, but who doesn't these days until you can get hold of Mismanaged, as far as I'm concerned, in previous years. So, you know, I think I'd like to uh, move a motion of thanks to the existing uh, boss and, and yourself and, and, of course, the board members as well that have uh, con been contributing to this and all, you, and all of your helpers. Um, I'm sure there's someone here that will second it anyway. Thanks, Keith. Um, thank you, Keith. I appreciate that. Um, do we have any other questions or comments? Yes. <laughs> <coughs> Don't worry, it'll only be a quick one. Um, also, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, go ahead with what uh, Paul and uh, Keith have said about thanking the management. Um, I can see myself, not being a very computerised person, but I can see myself from what you have presented here, that we have actually made some gains. But personally, I lament the fact we don't have a national flying anymore. And I would really like to see us be able to get back to the point where we can have that even if we start off every third year or second year. And that's um, really about it. <laughs> just on that note, David, we're, uh, we're working with the SAAA and, um, and other organisations. So I'm not sure who's signed up, but the APF, GFA, I think are there. Actually, GFA aren't. Uh, Warbirds, <coughs> um, we're aiming for September this year to be out at uh, Narromine. Um, so we'll be partnering with, with all the other aviation organisations. Um, it'll be... It'll be a return to what it used to be, so the workshops and the seminars. Um, it, it'll basically be a member event rather than an air show. Um, that was our one stipulation when we were working with the SAAA. We don't want an air show. We want something for the members. So um, stay tuned. We're working hard to bring it back. Um, anything else? Um, can I, yeah, can I get a, um, a mover to accept the President, Secretary and Financial and CEO reports? Is that a question or a move? So Neil Bradley to move and Cole Jones uh, to second. Um, all those in favour? I think that's carried. Thank you. Um, 
I, I think now's an appropriate time to say, um, after we've had a look at the finances, um, I just want to say a personal thank you to Don. Uh, he's been our treasurer. Came in pretty short notice uh, late last year when uh, Andy Saywell had to step down. Don's done a, a great job um, working with Michael to continue the work of Jim Tatlock and, uh, and others that, um, that came before him. Um, Don uh, let the board know today that he's going to step down. He'll stay on the board until his term expires, but he's going to step down as treasurer and, uh, and Barry Windle's going to take over his role um, effective today. So um, I'd just like to say thanks to Don. Um, <clears throat> on that note, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the, the big subject of the day. We've got a, a number of special resolutions uh, that, um, that are going to be put up. We'll, um, I'll hand over to Tony to, to handle it, but we'll have a short question and answer session. We'll allow Mike, uh, Mike Smith, who moved the, the resolutions, to have a, a quick say. We'll open it up to the floor uh, for a few minutes to um, discuss the issues, and then uh, we'll conduct the poll. Thanks, Mick. Um, so the uh, special resolution uh, is a multi-part resolution, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, it was included in the notice of meeting. I'm not proposing to uh, read it here. It was moved by Mike Smith and seconded by um, Trevor Bange. So we might start out by uh, asking Mike to uh, speak to uh, this resolution, and we'll go from there. We'll take some... Uh, questions and comments after that. Thank you, Tony. My name's Mike Smith. Uh, yes, I have technically moved it. Um, I think looks like everybody's got... Yes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I guess the next thing is to uh, throw it open to the floor for uh, discussion, input. Um, so, uh, Mick, do you want to uh, chair that? You're the chairman, so... Uh. Um, questions? Yep, we've got one from Max. Uh, Max, Max Brown, uh, Holbrook. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think we're talking about one resolution in six parts. Can you just make it clear that there will be one vote, that we're not breaking this up into six parts, because uh, the way it's been presented it is one resolution. Can you confirm that? Um, that is correct. It is yeah. one resolution. Uh, for explanatory documents and, and whatnot, we numbered it so we could break it down and explain it a bit easier, but it is one single resolution. Are there any other questions? Uh, Jill? <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Mr Chair and uh, fellow members, uh, I've got a great problem with this uh, resolution because it's always been presented to the members as six resolutions. Is that correct? Uh, no, like I say, we broke it down and we numbered it. Every single uh, communication I've received is always mentioned six resolutions. No, on, on the, the formal notice for the general meeting, which I've got here in front of me, um, it's, it's one resolution. On the proxy forms, etc. I'd like et cetera, to remind you, our current mm -hmm. constitution, which I assume we're operating under, yes. under section 30, section 2, you'll read that there's an annex in our uh, constitution which states that we're supposed to have a proxy forms sent out on that exact notification. Yep. This was not done. <coughs> Can you explain to me why this was not done? Uh, yeah. What, what we did was um, we, we consulted with Spencer, and I'll let Spencer have a, a chat in a moment. Um, Spencer's our legal advisor. Uh, we consulted with Spencer because these were complex resolutions um, and the form was quite limiting in terms of space to write uh, what you wanted. Uh, we chatted with Spencer prior to sending that out and, um, and asked him his opinion on whether that would be valid. Uh, Spencer basically said, yes, if you're making it simple but you're containing all the information um, in the form that it was contained in the, uh, in the Constitution, then well, that I'm would sorry, be valid. I'm sorry, you're not convincing me. It states it shall be of this format. Okay. Um, not can perhaps, I... maybe, or <coughs> if, but it shall be. Now, I appreciate your legal uh, representation, but that is just one representation. 
and I just don't believe that it was presented to our members to vote on each of these special resolutions. And I think our members are suffering on this basis. They're being overlooked. Um, can I just hand it to Spencer to get an explanation? Um, yeah, here you go. Um, I'm Spencer Ferrier and uh, I was involved in drafting the Constitution and uh, also involved with preparing these documents. Um, in short, they are a bunch of statements which gather together the change from the organisation being uh, an organisation uh, based in the Australian Capital Territory to being an organisation under the Australian Companies Law or ASIC as a company limited by guarantee. That's because this organisation as it's repaired itself and become better organised now must really move to be able to deal with the business and membership matters in a far more effective way which is what happens under the company limited by guarantee structure. What happens is that the old organisation morphs into the new. Uh, we don't really have two organisations, we have an old one that becomes the new. Uh, from one point of view that's uh, that might cause difficulty but principally it's very economical and it is because uh, the, uh, the company law management and the parliaments realise that as organisations such as RAOs grow, uh, they need to move without the penalty of stamp duty and taxes stopped and another one started. So what we are facing with this group of really the process of moving from one corporate structure to another. And although each step has to be taken, they are part of an overall uh, step moving from one format to another with almost no relevant change to um, to the organisation as we leave it or as we enter it. And for that reason there is no merit in dealing with each of these resolutions separately. They are a group of resolutions as a whole. Um, it depends on which way you cut it, but it's reasonable to say that the resolution is actually one resolution with six parts uh, rather than six resolutions. And there's no requirement, as I see it, that it be divided up uh, into six parts or subdivided into even more if you tried to do so. Um, in terms of the organisation, everybody who has taken part is well aware that the overall purpose is to move from the uh, older, inefficient organisation to the more effective company limited by guarantee. And these are the steps that get you there. And that is really a single resolution to move from one status to another by six steps. That's why it's done that way. Thank you. Um, just before you put the microphone down, Spencer, um, can you just address the question of the form, of the, the proxy form and the layout uh, and the, the deviation from what was in the Constitution? Uh, I think I'm being asked to comment on the fact that the a proxy form is not literally the same as is, exists in the uh, Constitution. But if you look at it, you'll see that every critical piece of information is there. The name of the proxy giver, the person who's to receive the proxy, the subject matter, and whether or not the uh, person receiving the proxy is to vote one way or the other. All of those things, when given by a member, cover the ground for a proxy to be valid. And so from uh, the point of view of the law, 
although the proxy may not have the strict formal requirements of a form or a, a, a part in the constitution as, it, uh, as we move away from it, uh, it is nonetheless effective in full because it covers every point and it's covered in a way that everybody can read, see and understand. And uh, so for that reason, the constitution uh, can be properly moved forward with these proxy forms. Um, it's probably also worth noting that um, we had a, an independent set of lawyers scrutinise the proxy process uh, yesterday and, um, and they expressed the same opinion that um, you know, not sticking with the identical layout as per the, the proxy form in the constitution was not um, a, a breach of the constitution given that we contained all the information. Uh, can you just repeat that for the purpose of the it people would online? That the people who are doing the constitution, uh, whoever they may have been, have made a deliberate act to put out a different proxy. Is this correct? Um, yes, it is. In short, it is. We, we set out to make it as simple as possible um, for people what to understand what they were voting simple, on. I make it very confusing, in my, <coughs> in my opinion, and it's just an opinion. And um, I don't think you're acting within the law of the constitution. And if you're not going to act in the current constitution, what makes you think we're going to act in, you're going to uphold the newer constitution? What, when, when we, before we did this, we, we sought legal advice to ensure that we weren't operating against the spirit of the current constitution. Um, and that's the advice that we got and, uh, and that's what we acted on. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I trust our, our paid professionals to make that decision and we acted on that advice. But I believe our constitution, you don't have to be a lawyer to read it. You can just see what it says and you should have abided by it. And I think that's failing to represent your members properly. Um, look, I'm going to have to agree to disagree on that. Um, as I say, we sought the proper legal advice um, from a, a paid professional and we've, we've acted on that advice. We've had um, <clears throat> close to a thousand votes uh, on this and people have been extremely satisfied with the process that we've put in place. Well, those, uh, you may have had the proxy votes. However, I don't believe that you've given the members an opportunity to vote correctly on those uh, individual resolutions. Uh, again, I'd have to defer to our, our legal advice and say that you know, we, we disagree. Um, we've, we've acted... Yeah, um, absolutely. Th those resolutions are, are all codependent. We can't have one without the other. They all fall over if they don't go together. So, yeah. Uh, hang on. <coughs> Max Brown, Holbrook again. Uh, there's nothing to prevent a resolution being in several parts as I read it. So, and it's up to you as chairman to either uh, decide whether each uh, part of that resolution be voted on or it be voted on as a whole. Um, yeah, that, that's completely right. The way it's been presented and the way that people have voted on the, the, um, the true proxy forms is they voted... Um, yes as a whole or no as a whole. Um, to me, I think that would be disingenuous to change that today. Um. Um, it's also worth noting that the proxy form as laid out in Appendix A of the current constitution doesn't actually require the text of the resolution. It just requires the title of the resolution to be there. We've produced a proxy form that contains the full text of the resolutions to be considered. Um, so I think it's pretty hard to make an argument that there's been any effort or attempt to mislead the members on this. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Um, Martin? Uh, Martin Hughes from uh, Jindabyne. Uh, mine's more a question of process. Um, I'm, I actually um, uh, do support the um, RLs becoming a, a, an incorporated body, um, but um, I'm just wondering about how the process was set up. Um, my first question would be, was the board unanimous in approving that this draft be sent out to the members? And my second question is, um, if not, was there a resolution on the board uh, when the draft was presented to them to release it to the members, to send it out to the members? Um, thanks, Martin. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just flicking through some notes I've got here. On uh, 9 November 2015, the board was presented with a strategic plan and, and part of that strategic plan was um, a review of the constitution. The, um, <clears throat> prior to that, uh, dating back as far as 2011, uh, there were efforts to, 
revise the constitution uh, and, and put in um, a whole bunch of changes. We've uh, worked with the likes of Don um, and others that were involved in that process to try and capture all those elements where possible um, and then consult with the members. No, 9th of November last year, the, the strategic plan was put to the board um, and in that there were several key dates um, put out. Uh, the <coughs> uh, A few of these dates predate that decision, but I'll, I'll start the process from the beginning. The, uh, the process included from January uh, 15 to May 15, um, consultation with members and a, a draft constitution put out. Um, that was complied with in March uh, 2015. There were notices put out via email and the magazine um, and we received feedback from that. May 15 to June 15, there was a review draft constitution um, with, oh, sorry, we were to re review the draft constitution with professional advisors um, amongst others. So we, we got Spencer involved at that point and we started uh, reviewing it. We then, um, I haven't got the date here in front of me, but that was then put online and a, a lengthy discussion took place with the board um, at that point. Um, June 2015 through to March 2016, uh, the draft was put um, up for consideration by members um, and that's where uh, a lot of members provided input, around about 1,500 around the country um, face to face. Um, I've got an excessive phone bill this month um, from people calling me up and having chats about it uh, and via email and whatnot. Uh, and then that process says May 2016, which is where we are now, to vote on the adoption of the new constitution. Um, I, I take your point that included in that process there could have been some more um, review by the board, but that wasn't part of that process. And that process was uh, voted uh, or approved by eight out of the 13 board members, um, including Tony King, Michael Monk, Trevor Banch, Mike Smith, Rod Birrell, Barry Windle, Don Ramsey and Ross Millard. So we have um, pretty much to the letter of law, we've stuck to that process during that um, the, the constitutional review period. Does that answer your question, Martin? Um, yes, it does. Um, it does. To a point, but I think there was a lapse there in that there should have been a resolution by the board to accept the final draft and to put it out to the members. Yep. That to me would be due process and if that resolution or that motion was not put to the board and passed by the board, it would seem that the, the um, staff have actually gone ahead and done this without necessarily the full approval of the board. Um, I, I, I would actually disagree with that. I, again, I take your point that that could have been included in that process but the board did approve this process. And that, that was that was definitely stuck to. It's it's also it's also important to note that um, the the special resolutions have been put up by Mike Smith and Trevor Bange, um, not as board members but as members, um, as any one of you can um, put up a special resolution. So that's something else to to take into consideration there. Um, I think we had a question. Was it Cole up the back? In fact, you know, it's Colin Jones from Sydney. Uh, in fact, you've covered part of it. It's, it's open to any member of this organisation to put up a special resolution. And I guess Don has put up 54,000 of them in the past. Yeah. To enable I, I, the think, I think that's an underestimate. <laughs> a bit of an exaggeration. To enable the organisation to move forward. And, and this is what's happened this time, to my understanding. And there certainly hasn't, to my reading as a member of the organisation, rather than a board member, been any revolt on the board. Certainly you know, there's been a bit of noise on recreational flyer over the last... You know, a couple of weeks uh, from one member of the board, but none of the other members of the board have, uh, have come out in opposition to the process. And I think, you know, I think, you know, it's all been done fair and above board. You know, there are bits that I don't like, um, but uh, that's life. No. Um, and I'm quite happy with the process that's been gone through. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Cole. Um, does anyone have any questions on uh, any other aspect? Again, Max. Uh, Max Brown, Holbrook, yeah, we can't keep our mouths shut. Um, Mike, Michael, would you explain what the process, in the event of this resolution being passed today, what the process will be to elect the full board, including what will happen to the Troika? Uh, yeah, so the, <coughs> the current constitution um, basically empowers the executive to run the organisation between meetings. Um, we had... 
many chats with many people about this um, and, and it was decided not by myself, but um, although I was part of that process, but by many others that uh, continuing that status quo would be the way to go. So essentially the, the three executive members um, who would be myself, Tony and now Barry that he's taken over from uh, Don, um, <clears throat> they will essentially take a caretaker role uh, for the next couple of months. There's a whole bunch of strategic decisions that have been made by the board this weekend and all of those decisions will be binding on the new organisation. Um, we'll then, uh, pretty much the first order of business or one of the first orders of business will be to hold an election. And what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll go through and we'll have a look at the, um, as per the new constitution, we'll have a look at the skills, the knowledge, the experience, etc. that's required on the board. Um, they could be... Um, you know, legal, financial, uh, etc. They will be industry related. That's always an important thing to, to consider. Um, and we'll put out a call to members to say who's got these skills that we need on the board um, and, and who can take us to the next stage as an organisation. Um, at that... <coughs> um, sorry? Yeah, so, so that, that call will go out in, around about July. Um, over the, the next couple of months, we'll have that, uh, that process of receiving nominations. Um, the <coughs> the organisation will go through those nominations and, and we'll, we'll see where people address those points and we'll publish that to members. What we won't do is withhold any nominations from members. Um, all we'll do is break down the information and say, you know, Michael Monk has addressed this skill but not this skill, um, but here's his full uh, statement. Um, and, and it'll be up to the members. You members will then decide. Around about September um, or October, uh, as per usual, we have an AGM. Uh, those people will then take up their position uh, on the, the board as, as new directors. It's also important to note that uh, one of the three of us will also be up for election in that time as well. The new constitution requires that people step down. Um, when the number of directors drops below four, um, that means that one of us has to step down and stand for nomination. And that process will occur as well. Does that cover the... I'm just wondering, uh, th little things like, uh, are we going from the troika of three to five or to seven? Um, how long will the uh, the new interim board uh, stay in place? I just like let's take it from 12, 12 months from today. What do we expect to see up there in place of the thirteen? Uh, it'll probably grow straight to well through to the seven in twelve months' time. What we have to do is do a gap analysis, and we have to say what what skills do we have on the board, and what skills do we need on the board, and then we'll seek people to to. Um, to, to fill those, those holes. The constitution itself um, allows between, I think it's three and seven, isn't it? Um, three and seven. Um, and it is to a degree um, at the discretion of the board. That said, I've done a hell of a lot of work over the last 12 months. I don't want to be a member of a three-man board. I, I want to see us get the right skills. Um, I'm just like you. I'm, I'm interested in the, the organisation. Um, I get zero benefit out of this. I take time off work, I don't get paid. So I want all the people that can provide those skills on the board. And if that means seven, then we'll go straight to seven. Uh, <coughs> mine's dirty. <laughs> Are there... uh, Michael, you said uh, AGM this year, is that what you said? Yeah, as, as Spencer said, this is not starting a new organisation. This is transferring our incorporation from the ACT to the Commonwealth. So we'll have an AGM later this year. Um, and, and that'll fit in with the, the usual calendar. So it'll be around about September, October, as usual. Yep. Could be. Yep. Uh, we got a question up the back. <clears throat> Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm starting to read in the... ...by saying that they've got to have certain, certain um, qualification, educational requirements or whatever to meet your requirements to be elected to the board. So uh, that means that most of the um, membership will be alienated and unable to be eligible to be on the board. 
uh, like I say, we're not going to refuse nominations from anyone. Um, all we'll do is say that we as an organisation, in order to take us forward, um, we, we think, we the people you've, you've elected and trusted, we think these skills are needed to go forward. It's up to you to choose. We're not going to eliminate anyone. And in fact, we'll open up, up the pool to everyone. Um, with, with no state-based boundaries, you don't have to vote for someone that's in your own postcode. You get to vote for whoever you think is suitable. So there's no elimination of anyone whatsoever. It certainly hasn't sounded that way in the stuff that I've read and, and what I've heard here today. So you, you need to make yourself a lot clearer on that. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that on point. Um, questions, any others? Okay, I'll hand back to Tony to conduct the poll. Um, uh, Rodney Birrell, um, I'm one of the, the board members. Um, I'd like to speak against the uh, proposal um, uh, representing myself and uh, the independent board in the independent board members. Um, does that make any difference? I don't think you can hear me anyway. I don't think this transmits. No. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll try and speak up. Um, it was addressed from the floor before uh, that um, the board itself didn't vote on the final uh, product that was being presented to you, and it didn't have to. Um, the way the constitutional change is structured is that any one person can bring it forward and it can be presented to you. But I think it's important to note, at least for historical reasons, um, that this vote didn't happen, and I'm concerned about that. Um, in terms of the vote today, I think it's already predetermined from the proxies, but I don't want to go away from this meeting and say uh, that at least some of us didn't have some concerns, and I'd like to highlight some of those concerns to you. Um, the, um, there's been a major uh, structural change here. We're going away from regional representation um, uh, completely, um, and there are pluses and minuses for that. But I don't believe, and, and some of my colleagues don't believe, that's necessarily in the best interests of the board and our organisation. Um, we're going from a board of 13 to a board of three. And I don't believe that's in the best interests of our organisation. It, it's too few. And, and although it's interim, it's likely that the interim of three will go to five. And I also think that that's too small a number. Uh, it's not in the best interests of our organisation. Um, the, the perception out there of having three, a three-member board, um, uh, although it's not intended, uh, does give the impression of a takeover. Uh, and I think that's wrong. It's just not necessary. We don't need to have um, that perception, even though I know the people involved are very genuine. Um, the documents that are attached to the constitution are very important. We have a member's charter and a disciplinary procedures framework uh, that will come into place. And these are an appendix or an association with the, uh, the organisation that's very important. I would say that most people in our organisation haven't even seen these documents. They're as proposal or draft form on the website at the moment. The board hasn't voted on them. The members haven't had a chance to consider. I think it's important for the new constitution, with these documents, that they should be out there, they should be considered, they should be voted on and put in place uh, before we have a new constitution. The um, implementation process I'm concerned with, and I've already mentioned that. Um, in terms of members' interests, uh, where we stand. Our organisation was based on, on two basic principles. That is looking after our members' interests uh, first and looking after the industry's interest, interests second. That was where we started. Uh, our organisation uh, came from a, a, a wide range of different groups and clubs that came together to um, point us in the right direction, initially to look after our interests with CASA. Um, that came later. We succeeded because all those different groups were brought together under one umbrella, um, and, it, and it worked. Um, initially, we had club membership, we had corporate membership, um, we had flying school membership, we had individual membership. It was all possible. Over time, uh, that changed. We ended up with just an individual membership. With the new constitution, we're going to corporate membership being a part. Of, of who we are. In other words, bringing clubs, flying schools and individual aviation businesses into the fold. That's fine, good idea, 
That's why how it was. Unfortunately, in the new constitution, those people will be disenfranchised. They won't get a vote and they won't get the ability to put uh, positions forward to the organisation. So the Americans had a thing with uh, uh, no taxes without representation. Uh, I think it caused the uh, American War of Independence. Uh, and we're going to have the same situation where we have people that will be, and organisations probably required to be members, and I can see the situation where the flying school would be required to be a member uh, before any services would be made available to it. I mean, it's not compulsory now, but I think it's probably highly likely. Um, that situation will be that that individual group will be subject to the rules of the organisation, which is fair enough, but they won't have representation in their own right. Uh, and I, I'm not happy with that. I'm not comfortable with that in terms of a direction of where we're going. Um, as I said, the decision is probably already made today, so my uh, encouragement for you to consider are probably going to be of no particular weight. Uh, however, I still think it's important, I don't want to go away from this meeting and said, look, everyone agreed with it, no, it it's a perfect decision, and, and I don't think it is. It doesn't mean things can't be changed, but changing a constitution is extremely difficult, and I'm concerned that progressive changes will become uh, more and more difficult um, in the future. In terms of support from the board, I'm going to be informed that six members of the board aren't in favour of this change. Now, um, of significance, uh, but probably not, because this is a member uh, introduced uh, constitutional change um, and um, what the board thinks is probably immaterial to the whole thing. Um, I think that the structure of the change is very important. Uh, the incorporation of the organisation is important. It's a simple document. It's easy to work with, but it, it has those particular points that I'm concerned with and I really all I want to do here is highlight those concern, concerns to you before you vote. Thanks, Rod. Mick? Um, I just want to point out a couple of inaccuracies with what Rod said. Um, currently, schools, clubs um, can become affiliate members. Currently, they do not have voting rights. Um, <clears throat> there's no change. Um, your ability to raise a special resolution, there's no change. You can still do that. One person can submit a special resolution. Your ability to call a general meeting, there's no change. It's exactly the same as what it is uh, in the present day constitution. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify those points. Um, any any changes that you, you want to make to this special resolution, uh, to this new constitution, as Cole pointed out before, Don has demonstrated time and time again it can be done. There is no erosion whatsoever of member rights. <coughs> okay. Um, one more opportunity for any uh, feedback, input, questions from the floor. Uh, Neil Bradley. Neil Bradley, um, Marupna. Um, I was one of the, a new I appreciate where only seven uh, you're going to three seven people to run an organise an organisation of ten thousand people. Seven how much are they going to hear from the members? Are the members going to get through and get in the, the way I wanted a new constitution, I wanted a new way to go. I personally don't think that I think that the constitution should have been a separate vote. The um, way forward with a new organisation should have been another separate vote. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Neil. Um, one of the key things that, that we've heard when we've, we've been around talking about the Constitution is this member representation and we're moving away from a direct board um, member representation where you elect board members based on coast, postcode. Um, so one of the things that, that we, we will be introducing and we've spoken, we spoke about it in the e-news that we sent out in um, edition one and edition six 
um, was this concept of member advocates. And so something that I want to do a lot of work over the next six or eight weeks on is coming up with framework around member advocates. So members have people that they can talk to in their local areas and have their voices heard and escalate that up either into the office or into the board. Um, additionally, we've got so many communication channels open to us um, today um, that anybody from anywhere can contact anyone anywhere to talk about any issue, any problem they've got. I've, I talk to members from all over the country um, on email, on the telephone. Um, if they want to engage with me, they just send me an email or give me a call and I'll talk to them. You know, so I don't think there's going to be any erosion of any members' um, access to the office whatsoever. You know, we've been getting in trouble, Maxine and, and me recently have been getting in trouble in the office for replying to members' emails at midnight and 3 a.m. Um, that's what we do sometimes because it's a busy office and we work at all hours to get that information out. So I don't think the strain change in structure is going to change the relationship between members and the organisation at all. There are still going to be key people out there. We're going to have this set of member advocates who are are people not elected by the board, not elected by the members, just key people in the regions, in, in hotbeds of, of activity within RALs across the country to agitate and cogitate and raise issues and, and talk to them. It's similar to the way we use CFIs now or our pilot examiners or our ROCs. We've got groups of volunteers out there, people out there in the, in, in, in the organisation that feed information to us, the Powered Parachute community. Jill and I have been meeting with them um, regularly to discuss changes to the Powered Parachute limited board involvement there, that's an operational issue and we've solved it. When we come up with a solution, we take it to the board for approval. Similar things are going to happen in the future, I see. If there's an issue, we'll sit down, we'll talk to people. It's about that trust, as we talked about earlier, it's about communicating, opening the communication lines up and being a much more transparent organisation. And that's that's the vision that I have for the organisation. And I don't think um, that is going to be eroded or changed by moving away from the current model we've got. But I'll hand back to Tony now to um, go through the vote. Ah, oh, more questions. Oh, g'day, my name is Graham McGilvray. I, I, I like the direction, I think it's a good thing. I've been fluffing around the, the, um, the organisation for, for donkey's years, in and out and one thing and another. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the concern is because at the end of the day we're, we're working on a representation system. It's no different to a local government that has nine councillors elected by a, a constituency of 50 odd thousand people. So I think seven board members for 10,000 is probably not a bad number. Uh, the only thing I'd encourage the board to do, or the interim board or the caretaker board, if you want to call them that, uh, prior to the September general election, uh, is that you really look hard at making that number the full seven, because I think that's going to be important for you. It's going to be important for us. Um, it's going to be too much work for, for three, four or five to do, but seven will certainly be able to carry the load. I, I have no doubt about that whatsoever. The, the other concern I had was that sometimes um, you, you made mention about industry, relevant industry experience. That's important, of course, but there's also a perception out there that sometimes there's too much industry representation because there's vested interest in the board with uh, people who have business uh, within the industry uh, who might gain from a board decision in some capacity. So you sometimes need to think about the little people, as it were, uh, and can they be represented adequately. But apart from that, uh, I'm in favour of the motion and I certainly hope we get on with it shortly. Um, Martin? Sorry. Uh, Martin Hughes again from Ginderbine. I'd like to just follow up on what you've just been saying. I, I'm a, a local elected councillor, at least I was until two days ago, and, <laughs> and the Premier gave me the boot. Um, the, I was on Coombe and Ayrshire Council, and we have nine councillors. Um, Snow River Shire has seven. And when I first got on council eight years ago, I got on because I was trying to represent my community, which is around Michelago and that area, Smiths Road, Durangle. And... Um, the mayor put me straight very quickly and said, Martin, you do not represent Michelago, you represent all the ratepayers in the Shire. And I think this is a very important point, that um, we need professional people on the board, people who know how to run a corporation, know what they're doing, and they will hopefully represent all the members throughout the country. And, it, and you, don't, uh, you shouldn't be concerned about the fact that uh, basically you don't have a ward system. Um, any longer in the sense that you have representation from the different states or different areas. So I don't have a concern with the fact that uh, we have uh, seven people 
and I'm happy to go with the seven, um, popularly elected by the members uh, from any part of the country, as long as they are there with the right purpose uh, in mind and that they do represent all the members and that they are basically professionally capable of running the organisation. Spencer, Spencer Ferrier from Sydney. Mr Chairman, I move that the motion be put. Um, on that note, I'll hand back to Tony. Thanks. Conclusion. Not much really, but um, I'm not sure where Rod got those figures from before because I thought there was only one board member wasn't happy. But we've certainly discussed this whole thing many times over on the forum and it may not be perfect. There is no such thing as perfect. It can't ever be perfect for everybody. And I believe that what we've got is the best we can get for this organisation at this moment. We've gone from square squeaky wheels to round wheels that don't squeak. We're trying to make it run like clockwork. And thanks to Michael Linky and our fabulous staff, we're going in that direction. And we're going at a, at a remarkable rate. If anybody was here, that, I know there's some here that were at the meeting at Queen Bean just not very long ago, and the heat that was there and the drama that was there and you look at it now and there's mostly questions. There's a little bit of disagreement, that's for sure. And Rod, you know, Rod's not terribly happy. That's respected, absolutely. But we have got to a position where we are moving forward with the interests of everybody. This is not in the interests of Michael Monk. This is not in the interests of Barry Windle. It's not in the interests of Tony King. It's not in the interests of Mike Smith. It's in the interests of Everybody, all nine and a half thousand or whatever the figure is at the moment. That's what it's all about. It's not about being perfect. We cannot make it perfect in every way. It's impossible. So we, it, this has gone backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards over a number of months. There was how many member submissions? 50, 50 something? At least 50 member submissions and a lot of them have been incorporated. A lot of them. And I, I know one guy put in a big submission and he said, oh, I read the draft constitution and what I said was all in it. Well, that's what it's all about. You've, you've got the chance to write in and say, you can put in 25,000 pages if you want to. Say, this is what I want done, right? And we've had this consultation period now for months and we've got to this day today. Whether it's one resolution or whether it's six resolutions as a block is totally irrelevant because they're all codependent. You can't have one without the other. Just ask Don whether you can have one resolution without the other. It just didn't work. So we've started again. We're down to the resolutions and it's all codependent. It all goes together. And I'm extremely passionate about seeing this organisation go forward, keep growing, because when I came on the board it was a shit fight. And I, I just wanted to leave after my first meeting. But now I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, I'm proud to be part of a group that has come to this day today. And if everybody's not 100% happy, I'm really sorry, because we have tried very hard. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, Spencer has moved that we now uh, the motion now be put. Do we have a seconder for that? There's a, num a, a, num a number of seconders. Let's take Keith Baker. <laughs> um, okay, all those in favour that we uh, now put the motion, show by raised hands. All right, uh, at this point, uh, I'm just going to hand over to Michael Linky to explain how the um, actual process works in particular because there's a lot of people in the room who are holding proxies. Um, so Michael's just going to explain how that'll work. Yeah, and I'm independent. I'm not a member of the organisation, so I don't have a, a right to vote. What we're going to do is is call for yes votes um, first. We've got the, 
the proxies. So if you've got proxies that have already been identified as yes or no, you don't need to worry about those because we've counted them. It's only if you've got proxies that are as C fit, and we know there's a couple of people in the room with as C fit proxies, but we're casting yes votes first. So Maxine, if you could stand up and identify yourself, please. Maxine is collecting yes votes. So anybody in favour of the motion, if you could please hand your red card. You will all have a red card like this. Orange, sorry, orange. There's an orange card. If you want to cast your yes vote now, please give your orange card to Maxine and she will collect it. If they're a yes vote, yes. Now you just need to hand them in for yeses now. Yes. So these are all yes votes to Maxine, please. Or another staff member can collect. We're just collecting yes votes at this stage. Only yes votes at this stage. You're everybody is collecting yes votes. Only collecting yes votes. Yeah, I was about to ask that. No. Yeah, yes, no. Oh, she knows that. Yeah, yeah she knows that. Yeah, we know the proxies. If they're a yes vote. Exactly. Yes. Yep, so just collecting the yes votes and if you have been instructed with an as C fit and you want to instruct that in the affirmative, yes vote. Has everybody cast their yes vote? Any other yes votes out there? Going once, twice, that's all the yes votes. So if you can... No, 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 that's the yes votes in the room. We've counted the proxies already. The proxies have been counted. whether that was a yes or a no. Okay. okay. So has everybody done that correctly? Okay. All right. Now we need to collect no votes. So every card so here should be a yes plus if they have an as... So Jill... And the other team will collect no votes. So, if there are any no votes for the record, because this is a formal meeting. So, no votes or as C fits for no. No votes. No. Okay. Now, we are counting, but as somebody's pointed out, there is enough. Um, proxies already to carry the vote, but that's everybody has cast their vote. I'll hand back to the chairman. We will do an official count, but you can declare the vote. Sorry? You can declare the vote because there's insufficient no's to sway the balance. Yeah. Okay. Don't declare it, okay. Okay. Michael, um, yes. what about this guy? He didn't have any proxies, he didn't have no one's card. So has he been signed into a trump count? Yes, he's signed into a trump count. should have been signed into a trump count. Just let her know whether it's a yes or a no. Just make that commitment. 
Okay, we're just tallying the vote. Does anybody have any general questions about RALs while we tally the vote? Very good question, and it's something I'd like to see. Someone, someone put a special resolution up to change. Um, that could be you, because you, as a life member, while you can't vote on that special resolution that you put up, you can actually put that resolution. And I'll be the man to second it if you want to do it. Um, <coughs> But I, I, I agree with you, Paul. I, I think it's a, a horrible way to honour our, our members that have contributed a lot by taking away their right to vote. Um, so I'd be a big supporter of changing that. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. Any other Is questions it, or yeah, comments about RLs? Nothing? Nothing? Hang on, Max. <laughs> <laughs> I happened to look at the uh, disciplinary, uh, the draft disciplinary procedures today and there was an acronym in there. And I couldn't, I had to, I, it took me a while to work out what it was. Can I just ask that if you're going to use an acronym, uh, can it be spelled out in the yes, first we've instance? We've yes, that yes. Thank you. And the, and the whole process is going to go out through a... Uh, sorry, the whole um, disciplinary procedure will go out to a consultation process as well. So there'll be opportunity for everyone to provide feedback on that. Uh, yeah, question. Um, Jill? And then we'll have you back down this front corner. <laughs> I don't mean to harp on this process, but I attained a full licence last year. And with the tech manual that was in force and out there in the public that I could get my hands on, it said I was entitled to an L1. Okay, fair enough, you've introduced a system where I do an exam. Up until February this year, I think it was, I could not access that exam. And no, no amount of phone calls to RAI has cured the problem. I've since completed the exam, and I still don't have it as an, ex an endorsement. And I think if that's the way we're going to conduct ourselves, we've got to fix a few things. Yep. Um, can we take that one offline? We'll get your details, and we'll have a chat to Darren about that. Uh, because there's a lot of people that have sat the exam, have gotten their L1, like everything's gone through smoothly, but if there's a glitch, we need to know about it. So let's have a chat after and we'll, we'll address that. Okay, thanks. Um, yep, the, 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 numbers are, the numbers are in. Tony is just checking and tallying. We've had 41 yes votes here today and 13 no votes, but Tony's adding that to the total so we can declare the full official total and give you the percentage. We require a 75% margin, as you know. Yep, here's the, here's the... All right, so the result of the poll is that there were uh, 807 votes in favour and 128 votes against the special resolution. That includes uh, members present today and all proxies. Um, so on that basis, uh, I think the uh, special resolution has been carried. Okay, on that note, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Sorry, Cole, you got a comment? Far corner, Jill, far corner. We'll get you some rollerblades. Cole Jones, Sydney. Look, I'd like to move a vote of thanks to the executive in particular for their work over the last 12 months and to the board as well. Um, you've done a great job under, under bad circumstances. Um, You've put up with those people from NASA 
and, and all sorts of strange politicians, but I think you've come through well and uh, you have my support. for turning up and everyone for joining us online. Hopefully we've got more than 11. Close, we'll be around for a few minutes now. And uh, if anyone's got anything to um, to add, ask, um, query, etc., feel free to grab us before we leave. Thank you.